John, thanks for joining me today, man. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm going to do my best to try to keep this conversation as real as possible because I've known Sean for a little while now and he's about as humble as it gets. So I'm going to have to pull some of that, some of that out of him. Uh, <laughs> but I think you guys are going to enjoy this conversation today. Sean, why don't we start with a little bit about your background? Because not only are you, are you humble, um, you know, you kind of got that whole vibe of like world's interesting man to you when, when we're hanging around in, in our group setting. Um, cause I don't think too many people, uh, you know, know what you do or what your journey looks like. So maybe let's start there and walk through, you know, where you got your start and, and how you got to where you are today. Thanks. It's an interesting description. Um, I, I would say it's not an intentional mystique. I think my personality really is just one that I'm certainly more interested in the people around me than I am talking about myself. You know, it's, someone in part of my journey so we can go through that um describe myself as probably a, a self-taught uh, software developer i'm certainly introverted i think that plays into it as well uh, i'm always pushing against my natural tendencies especially in social settings uh, but teaching myself software engineering or you know, even going further back than that i was someone who always loved just building things in general you know building tree houses and Lego cities and stuff like that. And software became the way for me to do that without needing to spend money or at least too much money. You know, instead of buying supplies and Lego sets, I could just, you know, learn how to write code. And I always thought that my life was going to be working for someone doing software development. I fell in love with the space and I started applying to college and colleges of engineering to learn computer science or computer engineering. Uh, and that journey took me to Illinois, Chicago, uh, where I actually met my first business partner kind of as a result of a computer glitch. <laughs> we showed up at orientation for computer engineering. They didn't have us on any roster. They didn't know we were coming and they just threw us in a room together and pushing against my introverted tendencies, just started chatting up one person. And if you, know, you see us, see my wife and I at a wedding, she's usually the one in the middle of the dance floor ruling the party and I'm the one at the bar just having a really deep conversation with one person. And so this guy, Jeff and I headed off, we started talking and in a lot of ways accidentally started uh, a company together, a technology consulting business. And we grew that for a while. We started a, another business after that. And then, uh, you know, my journey took me to another company in the, the healthcare space and we ended up exiting to United Healthcare through that. So that's kind of the, the short version of, uh, of my career journey. Yeah, let's let's kind of hit on the the introvert piece for a second because I'm the same way, and um, you know the business world was was made for extroverts in my opinion. Um, you know, here I am doing a podcast. This is not something I ever thought I would be doing, um, but I am, and it certainly pushes me outside of my comfort zone. But how have you? What strategies have you used? Um, you know that have been successful for you in terms of allowing you to, you know, go out into the business world and push through that introverted tendency? I don't know that I really push through the introverted tendency. I think I just figure out what am I good at? What is my strength? How can I play to that? Yeah. And, you know, one of my strengths is, you know, building those relationships and strong relationships with people. Like I'm never the person that's seeking to go out and speak to a large audience. I'm the person who is really interested in getting to know someone, hearing their story, seeing what I can learn from them. And, and you know, in some cases, seeing what, what I can teach them in that. So, you know, I'll invest a lot of time with a small number of people and I'll go deep there. And those things keep launching into other one-on-one -on -one conversations or other coffees or other. so, so my networking journey and, you know, starting a small business, there's a lot of networking involved. So I wouldn't go speak to a sales group. I would go to, you know, find somebody on LinkedIn or find somebody that I could have a one-on-one -on -one connection with and kind of go deeper in that. So it certainly took longer to build that network out, but it was something where I think it's a deeper network. So I wouldn't say it's like I was able to crack that nut. It's more just like, well, what am I good at and lean into the strength? Yeah. More of a quality over quantity type mindset. Um, not to put you on the spot, but maybe you need to be the one that has a podcast because uh, you are incredible about uh, asking questions about other people. And like I said, you're the world's most mysterious man. So uh, at least within our friend group. 
Uh, let's maybe touch on <laughs> some of those early days um, in that tech consulting business. I mean, you said that you guys fell into it, kind of met each other by accident. Uh, you know, what was what were those early days like in terms of what was your vision? What were you trying to accomplish? Uh, and how did you how did you get to a point where you know you were at a business that was worth exiting? Yeah, the the early days, I can't say that I really had a vision. Um, it started out, at least for me, and you know, I, I can't speak for Jeff on that. Jeff may have had grander plans, but on my side, it was beer money. Uh, you know, I had still, even in the early days, like I really liked building websites. And that was kind of the thing to do. This was, you know, late 90s, early 2000s when I was doing a lot of that. And I would have a bunch of side projects that I would do for for people to build a website. And I was just sort of, you know, the kid that knew how to do that and everything back then was like, Oh, it's well, my grandson knows computers. So maybe, maybe I can hire you to make, you know, you're a lot like my grandson. I can hire you to, to make a website for me. And I think I approached Jeff at one point and said, Hey, I'm doing this project. And he's like, Oh, you do websites. He's like, someone asked you to do website. Can you do the website? And so we started, you know, collaborating on things that way. And it eventually got to a point where, and, and this was during freshman year of college. So we met at orientation the year prior to our freshman year. And I'd say it just became something that was consuming everything about me. So I was no longer going to classes. I was still living in the dorms. I was still hanging out with friends. I was still using the beer money that I was you know, getting through these consulting jobs. But I wasn't going to class anymore. And I think a year and a half went by and I don't know how to put this. Maybe Illinois, Chicago, and I had a mutual parting of ways. We agreed, and you know, I failed out of college in the process. But and I remember Jeff talking to me about this too, because I think Jeff quit, you know, quit school. I was I was forced out of school, but you know, I think his view on it and something that made a lot of sense, and I adopted that was college is a business. So they'll always take your money. You can always go back for it. And you know, and seeing this now throughout my career, the the experience that you get that really matters isn't, or at least in your professional field with a few exceptions, isn't what you learn in school. It's what you continue to learn after school, what you get through experiences. And that was something that going through a lot of those one-on-one -on -one networking things, you know, meeting people, having deep conversations, finding mentors was a really early thing that, and it still carries me through today, having a group of people that I can keep learning from and getting that you know, kind of fake MBA just through daily life experience. Yeah. So there's two things I want to, I want to touch on there. The first, I think a common theme in the podcast episodes that have been released so far and some of them that have been recorded, but not yet released to date is this whole idea of a lot of times what makes someone successful is that they're really good at doing the mundane tasks um, or the, the difficult areas of whatever their offering is. I think I released a video about it this week, actually. It sounds like you just had an immense joy for doing what you what you do. Is that kind of your story? You just enjoyed doing what it was and it, it led you to this path of, of success? Or were there times in there where, yeah, you like doing what you do, but there were, you know, these tasks and whatnot that maybe weren't your favorite? When you're small, huh? I mean, even as you ask that, when you're small, you're kind of doing everything. You know, as, a, as an early stage entrepreneur, you know, you're doing the thing that you love. And maybe that's most of your time in the very early stage. And as you start to grow, you start to get any traction. Then you're getting pulled into all these different directions that you may or may not like. You know, and it maybe it becomes more of, you know, purely just a middle manager type role is you hire a couple people and you, you start shifting and doing bookkeeping, you're doing accounts receivable, accounts payable, you start to get pulled up in all those things and pulled away from what you were in. Like in my space, it was doing the software engineering. And part of that was, well, you know, I'm getting so pulled in some of these other directions. And so I built a task management platform in the very early days of our consulting company that started to manage all, you know, manage our billing and manage our tasks and manage customer requests, all that sort of stuff. So that was like something that I would then do at night was build this internal operating platform for the business. And then during the day, do all the other distracting things that I didn't really like. And then 
you'll get to a certain point, which is where we got maybe 10 years into that first business where we were really just doing customer relationship management and, you know, doing staff development. It wasn't, we weren't really doing much of the, you know, problem solving things that I think we both loved so much in the very early days, but you evolve, like you learn more, you find more about yourself, you get more experience. And, you know, I shifted away from, and you don't want me writing any software anymore these days. Like I'm so far away from that. Um, but where my passion really took me was more about building teams and getting great people together, getting diverse groups together to solve interesting problems. And, and that was kind of what I learned over the course of 10 years and, and what took us to the second business that we started. Yeah. So before we move on to the building teams portion, uh, cause that was one of the topics I wanted to hit on. I want to hit on this whole idea of like experience over education. What I mean by education, meaning schooling, right? There's other forms of education uh, as well, but I think as, and this is not meant as a career podcast, right? Giving career advice to those that are in high school or, or college or anything by those means. But what are your thoughts in terms of finding ways to go out and provide experience that will lead you to be successful? I know, you know, in my world, you go, I went to accounting program and was taught, you know, the bricks and sticks of accounting. Uh, but I've certainly learned more in accounting in my day-to-day -day life. I learned more in accounting in a vending machine business that I ran in high school. Like, you know, it, it's great. I, I certainly enjoyed college. I got a lot out of it, but I've also gotten more out of my career uh, to date than I did, you know, in a four year sitting in a, in a classroom. Well, I, you know, I, it certainly depends on the field that you're in. Like I'm not necessarily going to trust a doctor who didn't go to medical school to treat me, but even in that field, you continue to learn. There's new procedures, there's new types, there's new science, there's new things that come up. And so, so much of that experience and you need to have the motivation to continue to learn comes from, you know, either your curiosity, you know, what do you see through those experiences that you want to dig deeper in, learn more about yourself or learn more about that, you know, specific topic, or just seeing what comes up through, you know, through the day to day where you keep having these experiences to then draw on down the field and down the line and see putting this thing and that thing back together, you're collecting all these different dots that you, maybe you can connect for a new problem that comes up five years down the line. But it's so much of that experience, so much about learning how other people solve problems is something that I've learned a lot from seeing different people interact, seeing you know, different approaches to things, right? There's, and it doesn't matter what it is, there's you know, any problem that you're going to face in business and life, whatever, it's a solvable problem. Maybe you don't know how to solve it. Maybe you haven't experienced the things that you need to put that solution together, but it's solvable. You can overcome whatever challenge that is. You just have to find the right way to do it or find the right people, find the right expertise. Yeah, I think uh, at least looking back at my own experience, one of the reasons why I've taken more from my career trajectory than I did from my education is my experience in education is they didn't teach me how to solve problems. Um, it was more learning knowledge, obtaining knowledge. Uh, and, and I think throughout my career, there's just been certain things that have popped up here and there where, you know, your education couldn't get you through it and you had to find ways to, to get through. So that's, I think that's why I've taken more from, from experience than I have from, from education thus far. I do want to hit on this whole idea of curiosity and maybe this will lead us into building teams is curiosity something that you can teach or is that just innate in a person's being? Yeah. You know, it's a good question. Um, I think I'm naturally curious, but I don't know how other people approach that. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, curiosity, there's, you know, it's one thing to be curious and, and want to ask the question. But none of that matters unless you're, you actually care. Like, is there a genuine curiosity to it where you're going to listen, you're going to probe, you're going to ask those other questions, kind of like 
you know, having a, a conversation with someone who you naturally, who you, you know, you find you want to hear the answer. You want to listen, you want to pay attention to it. You're not daydreaming about something else while you have a, you know, meandering conversation. So, you know, curiosity, I think is something that anybody, I, I think we all have on some level. Um, so I don't know if it's teachable or if it's just human nature, but it's, I think, critically important to continuing to grow. Yeah. Maybe the, uh, maybe the answer is that you can teach curiosity, but you can't teach caring. I don't know. Um, just an interesting thought that I had as you were that, talking. That, yeah. I think, uh, and, and, and what I meant by this would be a good segue into this whole idea of building teams. What are the things that you look for when, when building a team? I think it was interesting how you hit on the early part of your journey, how you just liked building things and solving problems and building a team is, is no different in my opinion, right? Um, you know, the team that you build for your industry may not work for the team that I build for mine, uh, because it's a, it's a, unique set of problems that you have to solve and you have to have a unique set of people that can attack it with a different mindset. So what are the things, at least within the industry that you've been in thus far in your career, what are the things that you look for when building small teams? The very first thing I look for is, you know, first defining what are we trying to do as a team, you know, for starting from just one person being yourself. What are you looking to do with that team? And then being, you know, really critical and honest about yourself. So being very self-aware of what, are, what am I good at and what am I bad at? What do I want to do and what should I not be doing? And trying, you know, that first person you're going to bring into that needs to be someone who's complimentary. You don't want it to be someone who is like a complete reflection of yourself, someone who you would typically get along with and go hang out with, and you have all the same passions and hobbies and all those other things, right? Because you probably aren't going to have good challenging conversations with each other. And then as you keep hiring, keep building, you know, keep adding to that team, you're always looking and assessing the team that you've got. What are we really good at? What are the, you know, how can I keep positioning the people that I have on the team right now to keep playing to their strengths? And what gaps do we have that we need to fill in? And, and still part of that and something that is a, a piece of advice that I got very early on from somebody was you have to have a diverse team. And some of that is to, you know, the same thing where you want to be able to have these really good debates about things. You want to have different approaches to it, but you need people with different experiences, different types of educational background, like in the software engineering space. I love having someone who has the college degree or PhD. And I love pairing that person with someone who doesn't have that because you're, you're going to learn how to solve things differently and you don't know what's going to come up in the future. So you want to be able to have all of these different experiences and different backgrounds and, you know, from across the board, no matter what, you know, how you want to define diversity. I think that's critical to a team to have that. So you have these different perspectives. So then how, how do you manage building a diverse team, right? People with different backgrounds, different education, um, however you define diversity, as you said, while also cultivating a culture, right? That's such a big word in today's business landscape of, oh, what is your culture? Um, how do you how do you focus on building that while also making sure you maintain that diversity? That one, I think, comes down to making sure that you're hiring, you know, good, just good humans. I think, go, you know, is a big part of that, too. You know, finding people that, and it, there are times where you're, you might find someone who is extremely talented. They're an amazing person. They've got, they've got an arrogance. They've got an ego. And that's someone who maybe they check all the boxes for this is the perfect person I've got, except for the one where it's like, if I'm stuck in an elevator with this person, is that going to be the worst experience in my life? <laughs> you know, it's maybe it's the asshole test, however you want to do it, but that's not someone who, when things get really tough, that's not an, you know, it's not something you really want to have on the team. Cause that's just going to be one more stress point on the team at that point. If you have a bad culture, if you've got a bad fit for that, 
Uh, and they may be a great fit somewhere else. They just may not be a great fit for the team, the environment, the mission that you have with you know the team that you're building. Yeah, I think I've seen, I, I don't think, I know I've seen examples of that in my career of um, great human, um, really good at what they do, but something about you know where they are in, in life or um, about their role, you know, it just, it's not a fit and it's almost a, a detriment, um, to the rest of the team. I know in the, um, I can't think of his name, but the author of, of the, uh, the guy that started Netflix, he wrote a book and, you know, he wrote about once you find, um, those that aren't a right fit moving on quickly, otherwise it's kind of a drag on the, on mm -hmm. the rest of the team. What else, um, would you say in terms of, things that you look for when trying to build a team. So obviously we've got, you know, being critical and honest, finding people that are complimentary, uh, remaining diverse and finding good humans. Are there any other things that you kind of look for on a regular basis in terms of building that team? In my experience, uh, and this is maybe part of the companies that I've been a part of, uh, people that care about the mission that you have as an organization is something that, I think has, has really shown through. It really helps keep people, you know, one engaged, it helps keep people with the organization. And if it's something that you truly care about, that you care about the outcome of this, you care about your customer base, you care about the problems that you're solving, I think you're going to end up with a better product at the end of the day. Um, and that's something that like I always look for, is this something that I'm truly passionate about? And is this something that I'm, excited to obsess about and like obsess in a good way where if I'm going for a run, is this still something that I want to think about? It's not looking at my watch. Like, oh God, it's at five o'clock yet. So I can just end my work day. Like I, I like to be able to step away. I like to be able to just have things that sort of come to me, but I like thinking about whatever it is that I'm doing. So then let's maybe take that through the life cycle, right? I mean, you, I think you have a unique experience in, in terms of this startup world and, and taking something from an idea all the way through the growth phase. What's it like focusing on that in different cycles, right? Of, of your business journey. I think maybe the biggest thing I learned from all of that is it's being okay, being wrong. You know, when you're starting out anything from an idea phase, it's still, just a hypothesis. And I don't know that I was always good at that in the early stages, but I learned that, hey, this is just part, like being wrong is just part of life. And so you might have an idea and then you hold on to that too much, but you know, being okay, being wrong, being adaptable is so important to that growth journey. And it may take you in a different direction that you didn't even think about. And then that end result may be something that you still care about, or maybe something that you're not as passionate about, but you know, if you're inflexible, if you're not adaptable to it, it's a great way to kill progress to it. You know, so I think more often than not, you might fail at something because you're not adaptable and you're not willing to take new information that you didn't first have when you set out on that. Yeah. And so part of part of all of that, I think, is, is being open minded to whatever's going to come and following the data, following the experience that you're really seeing unfold. And that's, I think, how you take it from from A to B. Have you always been like that? And you talk about like, you know, solving no. problems and stuff. I mean, <laughs> when did you learn that? Um, you know, I think that was probably most of all in the, the second company. So, you know, Jeff and I co-founded another company called Shift Gig with another friend of ours named Eddie. And, you know, we had this first mission that we wanted to create this platform that was more, you know, kind of a competitor to LinkedIn, but focusing on, you know, the blue collar, the service industry, bars and restaurant workers. And, you know, I had a passion for that. That was something like meeting this, you know, un, unmet market before, uh, before we came along or this what we, you know, we saw as that. And I, you know, I love that idea. And I, I think I had some problems when we really needed to pivot. We had this whole idea about how we would monetize it. We started testing it and we just, we weren't seeing any traction there, but we were seeing you know, looking at how other users of our site were using the platform and, you know, pivoting to a business there. And I think I was a little slow to adapt to that. 
uh, Pivx. Like, no, we you know we started out, we raised money on this thing, we should be doing this thing, and you know, and then we saw actually how successful the pivot was. You know, and still, you know, kind of comes back to just being open minded and you know, hearing feedback. But it's still, you know, another I think really important thing that I've always had though is. I may disagree with you or, you know, with your founders, you may disagree or your business partners, you may disagree on something, but it was always rooted in a respectful debate. We had a ton of respect for each other and you know, it's like, great. Hey, if this is what we're going to do, if we feel good about, you know, I'm, I'm on board with this, uh, you know, I may disagree with it. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, I was wrong. Like the, the pivot that we had was the right call for the business. We, we, you know, we really started growing from that. We raised a lot more money after that, that pivot, but it was, I, you know, I think that was something that now has carried me through all of the time, like embrace change, embrace being adaptable. Yeah. This is, uh, this is something that I, I mean, I, I think, you know, right. It's like reading a business book or a self-help book. You, there's things that, um, will show up in that book and you're like, yeah, I know that. Right. But it's just a good reminder. And it's kind of this whole thing that I'm going through right now of, of you've got to be adaptable and and you have to be able to pivot um because what worked yesterday may not always work and that's kind of this whole thing that i'm going through right now of the environment that we're in from the commercial real estate landscape what worked in 2021 doesn't work in 2024 um and mm -hmm. the way that you go about your daily life is not the same way or the way that you went about your daily life is not the way, same way that you go about it today um so I, I think it's just interesting that you you said that. I just kind of want to add to it there. I, I do want to pivot a little bit here, sticking with the word, um, and go back to this whole thought process of being critical and honest with who you are, because I think it relates to the meat and potatoes of what I wanted to get to in today's conversation. And that's this idea of imposter syndrome, right? Um it's something that I've dealt with a lot in my entire career before I became a business owner. Uh, it's something that I dealt with in college a little bit. What's your experience? I know you and I have talked about this offline before. What's your experience with, with imposter syndrome? You know, how does it manifest itself and what are ways that you overcome it or work through it? I don't know when I first heard the term, probably within the last seven or eight years that I first heard that term and like it, it set off a light bulb. I'm like, Oh my God, this is, this describes me, but you know, it really is that feeling that I don't deserve this. Like I'm just lucky. This is, you know, I've just been in the right place at the right time. And maybe some of that has to do with my educational background or lack thereof. It's all self-taught. It's all, you know, looking at people with, fancy degrees on there. People are obviously smarter than me, but there's always someone that's smarter than you. There's always someone that's better at something than you, you know, very rarely are you the, the best. Um, and, you know, I can't say that, and I go through waves with this where, you know, it's some kind, sometimes it's very, you know, pressing where it's like, this is just, you know, it's weighing so much on my shoulders that, oh my God, they're going to figure out that I don't know what I'm talking about. And then, you know, at other times it's like, well, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about and we need to, you know, find somebody else who does. We need to bring in another, you know, we need to, to do all that. So I think in some cases it's probably helped me in that and maybe forced me to be more humble and self-critical and identifying more of my weaknesses. And, you know, sometimes I think it holds me back where, you know, I could be leading that, I could be doing that, but I don't feel like I should be the one that's jumping out in front of that one. You know, it's, we talked about it early on, like I'm not the one who's gonna go speak in front of a large group of people. I'm like, they don't wanna hear me. Like what, what do they care what this guy has to say? Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's certainly something that's always on my mind. It's always there. It's always, you know, something that I think weighs on me on some level or another. Yeah, so this is something that you've been dealing with for a while, but it wasn't until the last seven or eight years that you had a term that you kind of put to, to it. Is that fair to say? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then how is identifying that term helped you in dealing with this thing that you've been feeling for years? Is that, has that changed? Has that evolved over, over your experience? 
you know, honestly, it's probably helped me accept it more and just move forward. You know, once you can put a label on, it's like, oh, well, I guess that's a thing. Maybe, maybe I'm not, you know, crazy. Maybe, maybe this isn't real. And so I think it's been freeing in a way to be able to put a label on it and understand that this isn't an experience of one. This is something that enough people have that we can actually call it something. I'm not alone in that. And you know, it's maybe there's a way to solve it. Maybe there's a way to push through it, but it, it's not unique. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what I want to hit on is this whole idea of experience of one. Um, at least in my experience, it just hasn't been talked about in my circles or, you know, I, I come from a family of small business owners. Uh, all of my grandparents are small business owners. Parents are small business owners. Aunts and uncles are small business owners. No one ever talked about it. And I would be willing to bet that they dealt with it in some form or fashion at some point. What has your experience been like since you've been able to put a label on it and building that community of, okay, this is what I have. This is what I deal with. Now, how do I overcome it? How do I move forward? I, I don't think I ever talked about it out loud until I heard the label for it. And I forget what, it, you know, forget where I first heard it, but, you know, certainly being able to talk about that is something that has helped me a lot. And, you know, it's, it's somewhat freeing to be able to, to share that. And I've shared that with people that I work with that I have, you know, it's like, I have this sense and I have this, and I'm not doing it to fish for compliments. I'm usually talking about it with peers or, uh, but it is something where it's like, oh, you know, this is, this is just like how my thought process works. And this is where I'm at. And if people know where you're coming from, if people know how, like they can, they can help to react, react differently to you or better, more appropriately to you and vice versa. And that's, you know, circling back to, you know, the genuine caring about, th you know, people around you, the things that you're at, you know, questions that you're asking, the more that you can really seek to understand others. The, I think the better that you can collaborate with each other. So then what, what advice would you have to people like me, right? Not really spend a ton of time talking about it. What advice would you have in terms of moving forward based on your experience? And again, everybody's an individual, right? So what works for you may not work for yeah. me or the next person, but what's been helpful for you? Uh, and what would be like the top three things that you would say to someone that comes to you and says, Hey, Sean, I'm dealing with the same exact thing. Man, top three list. I don't know that I'd come up with a top three list on the, you do you top know, two. The cuff, but I do think, <laughs> you know, I, I do think being, you know, one, just, you know, being honest about it, being, you know, really recognizing, Hey, this is a thing. And part of that still, you know, I'll say it again, it is almost empowering to say, well, Hey, I, you know, I recognize imposter syndrome is a thing. I, I'm really not a fraud, but this is just a feeling that it is. Look at, you know, take stock in the things that you've done. That can't all be luck. You know, you have brought yourself to a certain point, so it's it's not all there. But, you know, still continue to improve on that. Continue to be open about it. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to go and talk about it on a podcast, but I think you still have to go and be, you know, at least talk with your friends about it. Share Share those experiences. And oftentimes you'll find that, there are several people in your friend group that have the, you know, the same thing, whether it's imposter syndrome or something else. And, you know, you're, you're almost never alone in something and you often don't have to look too far to find someone else with that shared experience to talk more about it. You don't have to go super deep into anything with that, but it's still just knowing that, Hey, I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. This is, this is a real thing and it's not as bad as I'm making it out to be. Yeah. I, I think for for me, in terms of being you know open and honest about it, one of the similarities there is also being open and honest about that luck plays a role as well. You know, like I think in some circles you're just taught, well, if you work hard, then you're going to be successful, and there's certainly an aspect to that. But there's also luck and community and other aspects to it as well. So for me, being open and honest that like, hey, I've been incredibly lucky. But at the same time, I put myself in the right positions and being open and honest about not only my luck, but also the decisions and the successes that I've, you know, made over over the last couple of years. Is that, you know, something that you 
have recognized as well, or am I just completely off there? No, I, you know, I think you're right. Maybe to, to take it a little bit further, it's, you know, you can call it luck. It's probably more about circumstance and what, like going back to, you know, maybe what set all of my career in motion was, you know, you can call it luck, you can call it bad luck, but it was this computer glitch. And, you know, they didn't know what to do with us. They put us in a room. So would I say that it's luck that, you know, I happen to meet this great business partner and lifelong friend now, or was it, I made the most of the opportunity that was there. Like this circumstance happened. I could have just sort of sat and not done anything or just kind of waited for this to get resolved. Or I could have made, you know, made something out of the opportunity that was presented, found, you know, the, the upside in order that could be. And that, you know, that upside at the time was, Hey, you know, I'll make a friend here. I'm new to college. I'll go make a friend. I'm going to talk to somebody. And it's what you do with all of that. It's what you do with the opportunity that's presented, I think is, is maybe my takeaway from all of that. It's not that it was luck. I mean, you know, there's always some luck, but it's what you make of those opportunities. Do you seize those moments? Yeah, that's, that's where I was going to go next, because I think there's always positivity to be found and, and whatever it is, you know, situational or you're dealing with something. And I, I just can't help but kind of try to build a bridge here between dealing with imposter syndrome and also how you go about building teams. And like I said, being critical and honest. And I think if I had to guess, you're dealing with that imposter syndrome and being critical and honest about what you're good at and where you need help at and building that diversity has been a great building block in terms of how you've been able to build these great teams that have gone on to do successful things. Um, again, maybe I'm off base there. I just have a feeling there's there's some sort of bridge there between those two. Before we kind of wrap it up, you know, you've dealt with this for a long time. You labeled it seven or eight years ago. Looking back, what advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> you know, that's a tough one. I don't know that I would have, I don't know that I would change anything. You know, it's, I think every one of those things that I've done in life and each one of those phases, I think has gotten me to where I am today. And I'm, you know, pretty happy with where I am today. So, you know, maybe the advice is just keep on keeping on. I don't know. I mean, that's probably terrible advice, but, um, you know, I wouldn't change a thing about my experiences. I, you know, I, I think everything is, you know, well, I've been fortunate and I think I've been, I've been making, you know, making the most of everything that's presented to me. And I would, you know, encourage anybody out there to just, you know, try to find the upside in the situation that you're in, you know, any problem that you're experiencing is, you know, it's it, at the very least, it's a new learning opportunity. It's a new experience that you can have and it's something you can take with you to then help someone else out in the future that may be seeing that same thing. Yeah. I love that. Um, and let's, let's go ahead and end it there because that's the, the perfect spot. The only other thing I would ask is, you know, you've had a couple of exits here. You've built a couple of great teams. I'm going to put you on the spot. What's next? I don't know what's next. So right now I'm, I don't know, I joke and say that I'm retired, but really I'm, I'm looking to figure out what is that next, you know, really interesting thing that I want to do. And, you know, what is, what is something that's going to make me happy that I'm obsessing over that problem? So I haven't figured that out yet. I'll, uh, I'll certainly let you know when I do. How does that make you feel not knowing? You know, it's uh, it's kind of terrifying. There's there's certainly some anxiety that goes along with it. Where you know, how long is it going to take for me to find that thing? Am I going to settle? What you know, what is it going to be? So, you know, there's some of that you know anxiety there, but I know that you know I'll recognize that thing when it comes to me and make the most of it. Are you going to take the approach of of seeking it out or just kind of letting it come to you? Probably a little bit of both. You know, I'm, I'm going to be curious about what's going on in the market. I'm going to be curious about, you know, what other people in my network are doing. Is there something where, you know, I think I can help in some small way? And maybe that'll turn into something that you know, becomes the next thing to do. Sean, this is awesome, man. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a lot of, lot of great content there. I think just starting the conversation around imposter syndrome 
and not to be, you know, too deep in, into feelings and whatnot, but, you know, if you really start asking the tough questions, I think a lot of people deal with it. It's just whether or not they want to talk about it or not. Um, and I think it's just important if that's you just to realize that it's, it's common and uh, there is power in community and this isn't, you know, meant to be what I would consider a, an emotional podcast, but um, you know, it's real and it's out there and just realizing that it's, that it is and being open and honest about it. Um, that's kind of that first step to be able to move, move forward with it. Um, at least in my experience. So I really appreciate you sharing yours and, uh, I look forward to catching up soon. Thanks. And thanks for having me. This was great. Amen. Anytime.